I'm here today with Jennifer Oman Rodriguez. Jennifer is the author of a new book titled A Time to Mourn and A Time to Dance, a love story of grief, trauma, healing, and faith from Chalice Press. She's written extensively for magazines and publishers, most recently writing curricula to accompany Dan Erlander's work for A Place for You and Let the Children Come and Meditations for Christ in Our Home. Her late husband, Tony Rodriguez, was a mental health therapist specializing in trauma recovery. Jennifer is a recent graduate of Luther Seminary in St. Paul, Minnesota in the Master of Divinity program and is also the curator of the trauma recovery page on the CompassionateChristianity.org website. And you can learn more about Jennifer and all her work at JenniferOmanRodriguez.com. That's just the way that it sounds. J-E-N-N-I-F-E-R-O-H-M-A-N-R-O-D-R-I-G-U-E-Z.com. So Jennifer, thanks so much for joining us and congratulations on the new book. Well, thank you. It's very exciting to see it, um, see it in reality. Yes. <laughs> Yay. <right> here. <laughs> Yay. So, I mean, as you know, most folks know, I work with so many different authors uh, a lot of times before they've published a book. And so, you know, I'm always so glad to hear when, you know, one of the Writing for Your Life alums um, comes out with a new book. So congratulations on that. Right. And writing for your life and the conferences were really fundamental in my being published, you know, learning about especially the Christian spiritual publishing arena, but also what I needed to do in, in order to open those doors. So thank you so much oh, certainly. for the conferences. Well, you know, the whole area is certainly opaque, you know, for those that are not experienced or familiar with it or whatever. So, you know, the more we can kind of like share alternative paths for making a book happen. Um, I, I think, you know, what we're trying to do, so. <laughs> and you so, are. <laughs> <laughs> so, Living Testament right here. <laughs> yeah, yay, yay. So um, before we, you know, get into, uh, you know, your new book and writing and everything, could you tell us just a little bit more about your background? Yeah, so I, I'm, I like to say I am a fourth career future pastor. <laughs> yeah, so I started out in um, music performance uh, a long time ago and uh, transitioned into early child development and spent a couple of decades in that arena. And that's where I met my late husband, Tony. Uh, we were working for the same social service agency in Chicago, Illinois, uh, and I was um, starting up a Head Start Center, and he was one of our um, one of our mental health clinicians. So that's how we met, and um, and from a couple of decades in early care and education, um, a lot of time spent as a consultant in uh, organizational systems issues and fundraising. Um, I knew I needed to be writing more and not just grants. <laughs> I was writing a lot of grants. And I made a cold call to what is now 1517 Media and asked, you know, how I would write Sunday school curricula because I had this education background. And that led to just now years of faith formation um, writing for 1517 Media, and I've done some other writing for different um, publishing houses, too. But And from there, I just transitioned into magazine articles, and that just swept me into seminary. Uh, and so that's just the small small capsulation <laughs> of, of my Sure, life. sure. And now you're an author. <laughs> and now I'm officially an author. So, yes. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, you know, we all have a different journey, right? You know, and it's yep. each one is unique and, uh, you know, but you've made it. So that's what matters. <laughs> I, I made it. I made it through seminary and I made it through, you know, publishing a book. <laughs> so again, before we get into the book, tell us a little bit more about some of the other writing. You've done. Yeah, I have an article right now in the most recent edition of Gather Magazine, which is the women of the ELCA magazine. Uh, I am you know, I'm awaiting first call in the ELCA denomination. So that's out there right now. That's an article on self-care. Uh, I wrote a few years back 
um, and I was pretty fresh in grief and trauma recovering myself, I wrote an article for the Living Lutheran um, on uh, sudden grief and how that sudden grief, when someone dies suddenly in our lives, that's so much different than when we know that the death is coming. Neither are, you know, both are very difficult, but they are very different also. Um, so those are some of my magazine articles out there. Um, and um, concurrent with now bringing this book that we're going to talk about today out into the public, I am working a lot on a second book. Oh, good. And, well, yeah. I, let's, let's hold that thought. I want to ask okay. about that later. So right. that's excellent. That's great to hear. So let's talk about the new book. As I mentioned, the title is A Time to Mourn and A Time to Dance, A Love Story of Grief, Trauma, Healing, and Faith. So can you tell us the background of how that book came about? Yeah, I mean, it's not the book I wanted to write or anyone wants to write. Okay. Sure. So the writing that is the basis of this story started in my very punctuated, staccatoed journal entries uh, soon after my husband died suddenly and tragically. Uh, and they're just these very raw words. They're not even sentences usually. It just a couple of words here or there, or a phrase and a fragment over here. And I had started doing that just to keep myself going. Mm -hmm. you know, this is just a survival mechanism for me in the early days. Sure. Uh, and very private. Very, very private. I mean, journaling is a private endeavor anyway, but this was extremely private. Um, but about three to four months after Tony died, I had already been blogging before he died. You know, I was already a writer. And I, I posted a, a little essay, a little blog post about closing his business, his clinical business. Mm -hmm. And then like the last few days and the last few hours, because this business was just such an integral part of our identity as a family. Mm. And I posted that, you know, of course people said things, people who knew the story, um, but I didn't really think a whole lot about it. And then I happened to be at my youngest son's um, on conference, school conferences, high school school conferences. He was a freshman in high school at the time. And things were not going well for him at all, mm. as you can imagine. And um, I was standing in the middle of the high school cafeteria, and this is a huge high school. And there are people everywhere, and there's noise everywhere. And, you know, I'm, I'm in trauma recovery and grief, and I don't go out in public places well. And I'm standing there, and I can't really figure out how to do these conferences, you know, mm -hmm. how to stand in the line to see the, the teacher and how to hear that he's maybe failing. Um, so I'm just standing there, you know, as like a deer in headlights. And uh, we live in the Iowa City, Iowa area, which is a huge writing community. So there's a lot of writers around. And uh, another writer I know who's also a publisher just walked right up to me he didn't say, hello, how are you? How are you doing? He didn't do any of the stuff I was getting. Like, how are you doing? You know, I was getting a lot of that from people. He didn't do any of that. He just looked at me, he said, you need to write. You need to write about this. <laughs> wow. And he just opened a floodgate. Like, I got home that night, and I couldn't shut it down. Like, there was just words and sentences and images flowing, and I just started writing. Wow. Furiously writing. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's what became this book. Wow. Goodness sakes. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that had to be kind of, well, the whole thing that you've gone through is just a crazy, you know, 
experience, but you know, that's part of that craziness right there. Right. Right. But what a gift. Yeah. Yeah. And then, so, you know, ultimately turn it into a book with chalice. Right. Right. And, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of rejection along the way uh, and a lot of discernment and a lot Just of like every other book. Yep. Uh, <laughs> yeah. A lot of pages cut, a lot of revision. Um, but in, along that journey at some point, um, because I do live in this Iowa City, Iowa area, someone suggested to me I talk to Lori Erickson, who you know, <laughs> right? Sure, sure. We're good friends. Yeah. And so she met me for coffee and she's like, you need an agent. You know, I'm just telling her my story. She's like, you need an agent now. <laughs> like, okay, Lori, how do I do that? And she actually gave me a few names and one of them turned out to be Kate Sheehan Roche. And oh, sure. Not, you know, Kate. I contacted Kate, sent her some samples, and she wrote back and she said, I want to be your agent. That's awesome. I mean, not even like, well, let's talk or whatever. <laughs> no, I want to be your agent. And I just started crying. I'm like, this doesn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's wonderful. So yeah, cool. So, yeah, so Kate made the connection with Chalice for me. Yeah. So, you know, obviously you wrote about things that were tremendously personal. Yes. I mean, tell us about the importance of that, you know, for you and the book. Well, I decided, and this is maybe my covenant with myself from, from early on, and it hit in the writing and just in living in this, was that I wasn't going to hold back. I wasn't going to pretend and I wasn't going to like mold myself so other people would feel comfortable with what we were dealing with. Um, and that I was very clear about that in the writing. So the writing is raw. Mm -hmm. It's raw because I want, I want to show this experience. I don't want to tell it. I don't want to be, um, so abstract about it and intellectual you know trauma recovery with grief and grief with trauma recovery is just you know it's a sensorial experience mm -hmm. and it's an experience where um the mind is very cut off from the rest of the body mm. so things like writing and reading and speaking were very difficult for me. Hmm. I couldn't quite put words together. And so that's why, especially in the beginning of the book, um, things are very fragmented. The sentence structure is fragmented. And, and um, that was very hard for a number of copy editors. <laughs> hmm. you know? But I'm like, no, this is what it sounds like in a person's <laughs> brain. It doesn't sound like full sentences like I'm doing right now. Sure, sure. I'm five and a half years away from the experience and five and a half years into major trauma recovery therapy, you know, so things are different. My mind is now connected, reconnected with my body. So, yeah, so I was, I was on a mission, absolutely a mission. I wasn't going to pretend to be anything that I wasn't during this time. So um, obviously you've done a lot of work in trauma recovery. And, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you curate the trauma recovery website for CompassionateChristianity.org. So, you know, I consider you to be an expert in this area. And, Thank you. and so tell folks what really constitutes trauma. Okay. So there's a lot of different definitions of trauma, uh, along with what the, the clinical manuals say, the DSMR-5 is the one we use here in the United States. But I, I really like Resma Menikin's um, wording about what trauma is. Uh, he's a traumatologist, um, and I'm paraphrasing him, so I hope I'm not butchering this. But he says something like, it's whatever is coming too fast at you, too much and too fast at your being. 
and I'm going to just extend that and say when things come too much and too fast at us, our bodies go into a defense modes. And we're wired that way naturally. We don't have control over this necessarily. This is when, when you hear about fight, flight, or freeze. This is what's happening. Something's coming at us. It's too much. It feels life-threatening. And we go, our body starts to make sure we're going to stay alive. And it does that either through fight, flight, or freeze. Mm-hmm. So, so that's, that's kind of what's happening. That's a trauma response. And then, or a trauma experience. And then after that experience, if it's a one-time experience, or when things are done, if it was an ongoing and it's over, um, then we can have all sorts of, things happen to us. Not everyone's going to have issues and, and actually get a, diagno- a trauma diagnosis. Some people are going to be able to get themselves recentered on their own. But a lot of us can't. And, and that's when we get a diagnosis of trauma. And so I w- and also just want to be very clear, there is one-time trauma, there is There is um, trauma that happens over a space of time, like child abuse. And then there's ongoing trauma, such as like oppressive trauma, um, such as uh, as our siblings of color experience in this country. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there's a lot of different types of trauma. And actually, there's there's probably more than that. But right now, we just really focus on those like three major areas. Sure, sure. And I know this is different for everyone and given different situations, but kind of, can you talk a little bit about what some of the best recovery mechanisms are that you recommend for people? Yeah, so, um, so trauma primarily happens to the body. So when you're in trauma recovery, especially in the beginning, you want to look for what's called bottom-up therapy modalities. That means the body first, the mind second. So you're not looking for talk therapy because talk therapy is is top-down, okay? Talk therapy is about, you know, your thinking mind. And we want to be in the body. We want to reconnect the body to the mind. So you're looking for bottom-up modalities. Um, And those are things um, such as somatic experiencing. That's Peter Levine's work. Um, Those are things such as somatic, somatic psychotherapy. That's based on Pat Ogden's work. Um, it's looking at the body first. There are also other modalities such as EMDR, uh, which is what I use primarily, and that's eye desensitation, eye movement desensitation recovery. Uh, and that really, that's a kind of a combination mind-body uh, modality. There's also neural feedback. Bessel van der Kolk, one of the major pioneers in trauma recovery, uh, says neural feedback is like one of the best things for PTSD. It's much better than medication. Um, oh. And that's really a wild, wild modality because you actually sit in the therapist's office and they pu- put these, you know, these sensors on your oh. head and you're actually looking at a computer screen and you're rewiring your brain basically and waking parts of it up. Wow. Yeah, really wild stuff. But neural feedback's been here, boy, since the 50s, I think. Well, thank goodness there's, you know, so much science, you know, that's helping all of this. Yeah, there's a ton of science. So not too long ago, we thought of a trauma diagnosis as in the same category as anxiety. Hmm. 
and it has been moved into the category of stress. Now, it's not minor stress. This is major stress. Sure, sure. But, but, you know, so our... So it's the, that this field is very dynamic. It's changing. There is scientific research happening all the time. Hmm. Hmm. What about faith and, you know, the presence of God and church communities and things like that? What can they do or what roles can they play in all of this? Like, I like to tell the faithful that first and foremost, the thing we can do for those people in recovery and in any church community and any faith community, there's a lot of people experiencing the aftermath of trauma, some of whom are in recovery, some of whom are stuck. And one of the best things we can do is to do our own healing first. Hmm. Because when we don't heal, when we don't do the work, we run the risk of passing our unhealed pain onto them, onto others when they're at their most vulnerable. And that is not what God is calling us to do, <laughs> right? God is all about forgiveness of sins and healing and restitution and reconnection with community and self. So we want to be, and then the ELCA, we have this, you know, God's hands, um, our hands, God's work, it's, you know, and so we want to like do the work so that we can do the best for others. But that means starting with self. And in a lot of church communities, we start with the casserole, <laughs> right? We start with the book on grief. We start with our favorite passage in scripture that, that comforts us when we're feeling low. Okay. Some of that's okay. You know, we really appreciated some of the food that came to our door after Tony died. Some of, you know, some of that's all okay. But, you know, it's the way things are given to the person who's, who's in the pit, as we say, right? They're really in this deep pit like Job. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so that's the other thing I, would, I say to Christian communities. Go back to the story of Job. Specifically, go to the part where, with his three friends. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? And where did they do the most good, and where did they cause pain? And, and put yourself in, in Job's, pretend you're Job, but also pretend you're each of those friends. <laughs> And then, you know, start praying with God and to God about what you can do as a community. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what's the difference or, or similarities between, like, trauma aftermath versus grief? Yeah, this took me a while to figure out, Brian, really, because it was both, both things were happening to me at once sure you know and this was profound grief um not only that i had two my two sons were grieving you know we were up yeah there. yeah so so the thing about grief that's different than trauma recovery is grief is a very deep deep emotional experience so you know, grief is, for me, you know, standing in the kitchen at 7 p.m. on a Wednesday night and waiting for the garage door to go up. Oh. And it wouldn't go up. Mm -hmm. and it wouldn't go up. And I would stand in the middle of the kitchen and just sob. Oh. Just sob. That's grief that intense, intense longing. It's longing combined with loss. The aftermath of trauma is a very different experience because there's a lot of hormones coursing in the body. Uh, so when, like with PTSD, and for me, 
there's a lot of adrenaline going. So it was, I would lie down in bed at night to go to sleep and I would be so tired because grief is tiring and my body was so alive. Hmm. You know, it was shaking internally. Hmm. And I think, what is going on? What is this? You know, and then I was like, oh, this is what combat vets feel like. Hmm. Hmm. You know, so, so very different internal experiences and external expressions. Because I would lie in bed and shake internally. But if you looked at me, you couldn't tell. Hmm. You could tell I was grieving in the middle of my kitchen, you know, because my external behavior was just, you know, I was really crying and sobbing. So there are big differences. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So kind of on a little bit of a lighter note, <laughs> let's talk about the writing process. Um, okay. You know, kind of like, what was it like to write the book? Well, it was scary at some time, at points, you know, but it also was very, well, getting back to what I said about, you know, this disconnect <clears throat> in the aftermath of trauma, we're often disconnected from our minds. Our bodies are disconnected. I felt very disconnected from my love for Tony. Hmm. And this is, this is typical. Um, so I felt very disconnected from him. And the writing of the book, what I looked forward to every morning was that reconnection with, with our story. Hmm. Hmm. Our story before he died and also our story now. Mm -hmm. uh, so so that, that was something that really kept me grounded. Um, and of course, this was a five-year process from those first sure, sure. entries until the publishing. So, but it is to really kept me grounded um, with who we were as a couple, who, who we were as a family, how much I loved him, uh, and, and, and just really helped in my reconnection to him. Yeah, I can so imagine. Yeah, but it definitely, I wrote in the morning, very early in the mornings. Uh, I usually wrote with chocolate next to me <laughs> that sounds like a good method <laughs> right right I'm, I'm a chocolate writer um some people are coffee you know they have to have coffee or whatever and i have to have chocolate a little bit of both but <laughs> <laughs> some people are both i'm really just the chocolate um and a little tea uh but yeah yeah it was it was just a a lot of determining what were the most important aspects of the story because of course this is intensely personal so there are things left out because they they need to be left out sure sure right and so there was a lot of lot of thought and discussion uh, with my sons uh, about what to keep and what to what just to have for us so you mentioned earlier that you're writing again right you're working on another book right i mean so can you tell us about not just the book but kind of the ongoing process i guess i should say of writing right well i'm still a morning writer <laughs> i'm still a morning writer um the the first draft of the second book what happened very soon after like the third or fourth draft of the first book. Interesting. And I'm, I'm, I was in seminary for both of these. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a lot going on. Um, but the second book really came <laughs> out of some of the prayers and practices I've included in the first book. I just kept writing more of them, mm. like way more than I'll ever use. And um, that's formed the second book. So the second book is Meditations to Accompany Trauma Recovery. Okay. And it's a Christian lens. So there is scripture, there is prayer, uh, there's re reflection and spiritual practice. So it's a series of those. 
Good, good. Do you have any kind of idea what the publication date might be? No. <laughs> Too early. That's fine. That's fine. You, you just released your first one, right? So, I mean. I just uh, released my first one, but this one is really coming along. It's, it's uh, pretty tight, as we say in the writing circles. Um, so something will be happening, I think, pretty quickly here. Good, good. Well, I hope that, you know, the launch of this one, the first one, you know, goes really well. I hope it's been going well so far and will continue despite the pandemic and right. the other challenges that we have. Um, the, again, the title of it is A Time to Mourn and A Time to Dance, A Love Story of Grief, Trauma, Healing, and Faith. And you can find it on the Chalice Press website or Jennifer's website. Again, it's jenniferolmanrodriguez.com. So Jennifer, thanks so much for all of your work um, because of not just a book, but I know of all the help that you've given to so many different people that are dealing with various sorts of trauma. So I really appreciate your ability to get through what you went through and, you know, reflect the, the courage and the hope and the science, you know, the practicality for lots of other people. Well, thank you, Brian, and thank you for giving me a platform to share. Well, it's my pleasure. And, you know, it's just we were talking about before, you know, continue to keep me posted on your work so that we can share more of it. So thank you so much. I will do that. And thank you.